They were so much quieter. That's <laughs> <laughs> respect for you. So. I was always the oldest until he came on. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's about 6 o'clock, so a little bit after we're going to get started. This is the uh, Town Council's workshop on growth management and multifamily housing. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have quite a nice crowd here to help us uh, work through this presentation and the conversation, as well as a nice crowd of citizens. Um, the workshop that has been undertaken, workshops that have been undertaken in the past, we're going to follow pretty much the same format. Um, we're going to hear from our staff regarding the presentation and the current state of uh, growth management and multi-housing. And then there will be an opportunity for questions and comments from the public uh, before we adjourn so that we can hear from you as well. Um, I do want to welcome everybody. There's actually quite a range of people here with us. Not only um, all the councils, I do want to send um, Councillor Foley's apologies for not being able to attend. She had a prior commitment before we scheduled this, but she is, um, has submitted some questions that we want to pose to staff as well as uh, she's going to be keeping um, um, in touch with what we are talking about tonight. Um, but I also wanted to welcome, um, we invited four committees, uh, to uh, four of our town committees um, to the table as well, and so I wanted to welcome them, and if we can go around the table and introduce ourselves in case people don't know, um, but those committees include SEDCO, which is Scarborough's Economic Development Corporation, um, the Long Range Planning Planning Board, and am I, am Housing I, Alliance. Housing Alliance, so I apologize uh, for getting that. So if we can go around the table, and I'll start. Um, my name is Sean Babon, and I'm the council chair. Bill Donovan, town council. Judy Roy, Long Range Planning Committee. Peter Hayes, town council. Kate St. Clair, vice chair. Ellen Paul, Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, Will Rowan, town Kevin Freeman, uh, SEDCO. Chris Chiazzo, Town Council. Karen Martin, staff with SEDCO. Uh, Dan Bacon, Planning Director. And Tom Hall, Town Manager. And with that, I'm going to turn over the manager sure. to begin the presentation. Yeah, we have a lot to get through, so I'll just provide a couple of quick introductory comments, and then we'll get right into the, uh, the meat of this uh, conversation. Uh, it's, there's been well-publicized interest in multifamily housing. Uh, in Scarborough, in fact, the Town Council, many of you, have been involved in almost a systematic uh, zoning, rezoning, if you will, particularly in the growth areas. And in fact, I, I think <coughs> almost all zones in the growth area permit one level or another of some type of multifamily housing. Um, beyond that, the council in the past uh, year and a half or two has been more intimately involved in a couple of uh, projects. The Griffin Road project down in the Dunson area, Vesta or the Southgate House was another one where uh, a TIF was actually approved to help facilitate that process. Um, and then, of course, most recently with some specific zone changes uh, on Mussey Road to allow some multifamily uh, development there as well. But there's even interest that goes uh, probably 10 years back, with, uh, originally with Eastern Village and Dunson Crossing. There were always multifamily components of those projects. Just coincidentally, uh, they're just now getting to the point of their developments that they're considering the multifamily components of that. So all of this is coming together kind of at the same time. And that's not by surprise, and we'll get into some of those uh, trends that, that are emerging that have been well documented that really kind of bring us together tonight. Uh, and then kind of on top of that, and maybe the thing that will be the focus of the discussion, there's two larger scale developments that have expressed interest, uh, one of which <coughs> staff has been aware of and working with since May of this year. Uh, the other one was more recently uh, in August, but these are projects that um, one of which has been before the planning board for an inventory uh, site inventory analysis and has been well publicized in the paper. So these are no big surprises. They're kind of they've been looming, uh, but they're ready to start to move forward. And in fact, staff has held and slowed this process down for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to get acquainted with uh, with the projects, with the potential impacts, and do some analysis so we could be resources to you. And and, and a lot of that. Uh, thought we'd like to share with you tonight, uh, but also we wanted to make sure the, the new council was seated, kind of got their legs under themselves, uh, but these projects are ready to start moving forward, and um, we're not here to advocate on behalf of any one of those, but uh, really really think it's, it's high time that the council spend some time uh, to understand some of the background issues and put this uh, conversation in some bigger context, if you will. So the territory we'd like to cover tonight involves growth management ordinance and the related impacts fee, uh, fees, I should say, that relate to that. We have about 10 years of experience with both those mechanisms in place and can share that experience with you. Um, 
I guess the other component of that is then to do, we've done some analysis of multifamily development as a housing type. And that's a piece that we've had the luxury to spend some time with and to get acquainted with those impacts. And we'd love to spend <coughs> time this evening sharing uh, kind of the results, of, preliminary results of our assessments, if you will, uh, of that. So this is a collaboration of uh, Dan and Karen and myself. Uh, Dan will be the lead presenter. We intend this to be interactive and conversational, so at any moment, uh, please, by all means, ask a question. We, we want to make sure you leave tonight with a, an education on the background issues. Um, so please, by all means, speak up as we go, go forward. So please bear with us. There's a fair, fair amount of territory we'd like to cover, but I think in the end you'll find it informative. So with that, we can dive right in. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, and as Tom mentioned, we have a lot of ground to cover, and there's a good number of slides, but please do kind of raise your hand or, or stop or jump in anytime if you have questions or um, want to ask clarifying things or have comments. Um, and as Tom indicated, we're going to talk a fair amount about history, you know, what the town's experience has been in terms of the growth management ordinance and why we established it. And then we're going to kind of get into the current trend and, and interest in multifamily housing. And we're learning too. You know, this is a, um, a new thing for Scarborough, so we have some ideas, but we need input from the council and all the community <coughs> members and those in the audience and, and to learn more as kind of we go as we learn about different types of multifamily housing. Um, and just, just a piece of housekeeping. We have a fact sheet that's been circulated. I'm not sure if we'll speak to it directly, but we try to distill a lot of what's in this presentation on that one sheet. Uh, so it's very, very high level. We'll make that available online. And there were some other documents, more detailed analysis that we we'll provide in advance and are, are on the website right now. Um, so some of the information that's on this is going to be explained in this presentation because I definitely have some questions it. about it. All of some it. Of yep. this. this is okay. intended to be kind of a takeaway, just kind okay. of high level piece. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess the last piece I'd like to mention before we dive in is I'm glad there are some Long Range Planning Committee members here. Long Range Planning Committee has um, sunk their teeth into this a bit at their last few meetings. Um, and as the council typically has been depending on them to kind of vet and understand issues before they get to the council, they've begun that process. Um, we felt that it was important to have this workshop, you know, before they went too far downstream. But the Long Range Planning Committee has done a great job of providing us some initial kind of thoughts and feedback on all of this uh, subject matter. So with that, I'll, I'll dive in um, and, and just sort of start a little bit with um, really the history of growth management in Scarborough. I'm not going to dive too deep. Um, and many of you as developers, residents, um, you know, participants, counselors, maybe, over the years, um, probably experienced this firsthand. But Really, the history as to why the town has a growth management ordinance um, was the rapid single-family housing growth and development that was occurring, particularly in the late 90s, early 2000s. And this graph shows that. Um, it could be hard to see from your seats, but between 1997 and 2002, there was about 200 units being built a year. Um, and 90% of those were single-family houses and single family homes then and now um, typically have 0.8 school age children per household. Um, so 1,100 single family houses equals over 800 school kids. Um, so that really was, if you want to boil it down, that was really what was leading to establishing a growth management ordinance, which essentially means establishing a growth cap per year, regulating how much residential development occurs per year in town. So this graph kind of illustrates um, at that rate and the volume of single family home construction at the time. In terms of the impacts of that, um, again, principally single family homes, but also other housing types, but principally single family homes with school age children uh, were overburdening the existing school facilities at the time. Uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, the middle school and particularly the high school had pretty serious capacity issues, which um, quickly led to a major high school <coughs> that occurred early to mid 2000s. 
led to modular um, classrooms at the, the middle school, Wentworth, the old Wentworth, uh, as well as the corners. Um, so the growth management ordinance was primarily geared around school facilities, but there was also some stresses occurring on other municipal services, um, public works, police and fire, just municipal services that serve residential development. So in terms of addressing this, kind of two primary or strategic tools that were established were we need to control the pace of new housing uh, in Scarborough. And so in 2001, um, there was a growth management ordinance that was established, really aimed at kind of moderating or leveling out the pace of housing development, particularly single family neighborhoods that have um, that higher percentage of, of school aid kids um, as they are contributing to school kind of capacity challenges. A companion piece that didn't get passed exactly at the same time, but around the same time period, was establishing impact fees, um, particularly impact fees to help pay for school facilities that were being necessitated um, by the growth in population. So in 2002, 2002 uh, the school impact fee ordinance was passed, and the amount of impact fee varies by housing type. So a single family house, based on statistics, um, currently um, pays about $4,300 per new housing unit. Multifamily um, pays roughly $1,000 per unit. Two family, in between single family and multi, um, is about $1,600 per unit. Jack, can I ask a Sure. Does, does that vary by the size of the unit? Like in a multifamily, if it's a three bedroom, it has a higher impact fee than a one bedroom? It does not currently. And that's actually more of a, our impact fee ordinance hasn't caught up with how we're treating um, units now under zoning. Um, that impact fee has been in place since 2002 and hasn't been recalibrated based on that. So that's, but that's a really good point. Dan, a quick question. <clears throat> these, the, the growth management ordinance and these other things, where did they come from? Were they done by the council? Were they done through a comprehensive plan? Where, what was the genesis for thinking about growth and how we're going to manage growth? Who participated? How was it done? The council <clears throat> was the legislative body that passed right, um, but the ordinance, but prior to that, in 99, 2000, in that, sort of the height of the residential growth, yeah. A growth and services report, a very comprehensive report was done. Perhaps Sean was involved in that. I know many others, Rick Shanae, were involved in that, where all types of growth in the community were um, analyzed in yeah. terms of their tax value, their sort of their yeah. um, tax valuation and benefit, also their demands on services. Right. So are we, so I asked that question, are we going to follow a similar pathway this time and do some type of comprehensive analysis of, is that what we're doing with this stage? We started or? doing that with multifamily housing because we're faced yeah. with multifamily housing. The bigger picture is with the next comprehensive plan, which is right. going to start early in the year, is to look at all types of development in the community. But isn't that kind of putting the cart before the horse? I mean, isn't multifamily part of the bigger? Shouldn't we decide what we want to do in our community, what type of growth we want, where we want, and the types of growth, and do it all together? I, I don't understand why we're putting this <coughs> multifamily ahead of that comprehensive planning process. Right. Um, well, I mean, the town is through the past comprehensive plan, and we're going to touch on some of these things, already zoned for multifamily housing in a variety of areas, and a lot of them have been permitted. So some of those decisions have been made in right. terms of where multifamily should go. But we're looking for changes to that, right? Changes have been made uh, some, some quite recently. Well, yeah. We're looking at yeah. case by case. how they, the rate of development of multifamily through the growth ordinance. So there's, there's an interplay between zoning, which allows multifamily, and then our growth permits, which allows how quickly multifamily and single family can be built. So we'll talk about some of that stuff, um, and then I'm sure more questions will come up. Um, another key piece that the town's been picking away at in terms of impact fees are related to traffic and transportation. So 
And that's not limited to residential development, that's all development. Commercial development often has a greater impact on traffic and traffic generation, so impact fees are in place for traffic. And then I mentioned here other development requirements. Um, residential developments often have community services uh, impacts, needs for parks, needs for um, community service programs. So typically, they pay into that system, whether it's fees or donating open space or community service um, space. And and as a rule of thumb, do we have do we know the impact fees? What percent of the total costs they actually cover? I think it varies by. But I mean, in general, is it like ten percent of the total cost? Is it twenty percent? The that's a good question. Um, I mean, on, on traffic, it. As of right now, um, the Dunstan Corner intersection was done a few years ago, and the expectation is that uh, a quarter to a third of that bill is going to be repaid by impact fees, because a half to two thirds was paid by DOT and, and federal funding through highways. So uh, the, goal, the town's tab, if you will, is envisioned to be into, entirely paid back through impact fees. Um, for on traffic, but, right, traffic, but the other municipal services? Schools, we'd have to look at that. I mean, we're gonna, there's a slide good, later on showing good, how much it's been paid yeah. so far. Yeah. Okay. Can, just, can I yeah, just well. ask to clarify that? So, but, but an impact fee is a one-time assessment yeah. on a new construction. It's not mm -hmm. like an ongoing. Right. So impact it fees are a lot of, lot of, would be hard to assess, I would, I would think, you know, the actual percentage of the cost that it's paying is it would depend on how long that you know, building were to be existed and occupied. So over the life, it would it's be. It's not an operating cost. So impact fees are to pay for facilities and infrastructure. So if you need to improve an intersection um, because X amount of new development's coming in, it's to make gotcha. that intersection improvement, not operate, not plow the roads, not operate the signals. Similar to schools, it's to add classrooms, not fund the operating costs of the school. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, this slide, just kind of transitioning to the growth management ordinance in general, kind of key points. Um, in the early 2000s, a decision was made based on trends that 135 growth permits would be the cap. So that's considered the annual allocation of growth permits. And um, that's been the case more or less since 2001, so the last 15 years. Within that ordinance, there's also a limitation on individual developments that, so one project, say, a big neighborhood can't come in and use up the, the whole 135, so individual projects can only use up to 20% of the annual allocation. So that's roughly 27 permits. Um, and that's to kind of enable a number of projects to build out over time and not any one or two projects monopolize the, the permits. And, and this permit represents a, a single family home built in a, or permitted in a given year? A growth permit equals a single family home. Um, and, but if in terms of multifamily projects, because we allow smaller units to be counted differently, um, so through that scenario, in say a multifamily building, if you do a one bedroom unit, then that's half a growth permit. Um, because it's half, typically half the impact of a full uh, well. So there's some, there's some funny math involved. Another piece of, a key piece of the growth management ordinance is that it, it's in trying to incentivize development in our growth areas where, we, where there's adequate infrastructure for growth, uh, where we're trying to encourage uh, housing development. So that's so there's a maximum of 50 permits that can be allocated in the limited growth. So that means 85 permits in the growth area. And then a kind of a key topic for this evening is there's also this reserve pool of permits in our ordinance. So you have the annual allocation, which is typically for your kind of conventional projects that we've seen over the years, subdivisions, smaller, um, mixed housing projects. And then there's a reserve pool for special projects. And special projects mean ones that we're encouraging. 
through zoning that might include affordable housing, that might include um, development transfer provisions, which, which is uh, an incentive in our zoning, that might include a contract zone. So there's also this reserve pool for these projects that don't fit neatly under the annual allocation or are being encouraged. Is, the, is there application only when you run out of the 135 annual growth permits, or do they draw upon those uh, whether the 135 is used up or not? Over the last eight years, when we've been <clears throat> well under the 135, until the last couple of years we were getting closer, but generally over the last eight years we've been well under the 135, there's been no use of the reserve pool. Even with projects that could qualify, because there hasn't been competition or demand outside of the annual. So it's never drawn upon unless it goes beyond the 135. Correct. Or if there's a big project that can't meet the 25, the 20% 20 yes. allocation. Yeah. Because there might be, say, a multi-county project that qualifies that needs more than 27 growth permits. And these so-called special projects are defined in the growth management ordinance, so it's not staff discretion. Um, Correct. They're defined very clearly in in that ordinance itself. Right. Dan summarized them. There. I'm summarizing them. Yeah, they're not. It's not the planning board deciding or staff or Brian as zoning administrator. It's the ordinance dictates which ones are eligible. Hypothetically, if you know a, a project were to come along at the end of the year that would then cause us to exceed the 135, would there be a retroactive allocation of those of those permits back into into that, or is that? Too Only if it qualifies. If, say, there's a lot of development, housing development occurring, we're getting close to 135, then, and projects that don't qualify for the reserve are looking for permits, they have to wait until the next year. So, um, but the, the earlier project that might have qualified would not then go back and get re allocated from the other pool. Yes, we haven't. We haven't crossed that. We haven't crossed that. That's a good question. Yeah. So this slide just shows the growth management track record, for lack of a better term. Um, the first third of the slide to the, to the left is the, you know, that rate of growth that we saw um, pre-2002. And then the line across is 135 growth permits. And then you'll see that starting in 2003, we've complied, we've, things have leveled out. We're, we're below the growth limit. Um, and, you know, that's a number of factors. It's the ordinance. It's also there's a pretty serious recession <laughs> um, between 07 and, and 2010. We see a steady increase since the, the depths of the recession. So if 135 is a fixed and firm amount, how do you go above that in 2007? 2007, there was a project that um, was an elderly project, actually Bessie Common, across the street. And at that time, in 2007, before the ordinance was changed in 2008, elderly projects did not need to get growth permits. So that's reflecting that it went above, but they didn't have to comply with getting growth permits, because elderly projects don't affect the school system. So why so, did that show up on this chart? If it, because they still have to get the actual... Just showing the raw number of okay. units. So you know, we, we could take that out. Um, because they actually didn't get growth permits. I'm okay. showing the unit count that, okay. that year. Okay. And that entire peak from 06 to 08 probably is Bessie Square predominantly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Bessie Common, excuse me. Bessie Common is the, yeah, that high peak. With the high peak. Yeah. yeah. Another kind of piece of the track record I uh, mentioned earlier growth areas, limited growth areas. This shows the breakout of where permits were pulled. So the, the red lines are down in growth areas. The yellow, it's hard to see from your seats, are in limited growth. So that their you know, development's meeting that standard, and going where the town's wanting growth to occur. We're also showing multiplex development that's happened over the last eight years, and then some affordable housing. Um, that we've gotten recently through the Habitat Project. So that, that's showing compliance with our different types of growth permits. And Dan, sorry, the affordable is the definition as, as, as applied by what? What's, what by our, or by our zoning ordinance. Okay. So it's, um, 
it's rental, it's 80% of median income. If it's ownership, it's, well, now it's 80 It was 120, but it's now it's 80 So it's our, it's, it's a local the, ordinance, it's not like county or state. It's, or defi like it's defined by need, too, so they're somehow secured into the future to be affordable. Mm -hmm. right. Be restricted and affordable. Yeah. So quickly, I wanted to show, maybe to some of your questions, Peter, um, impact fee track record. Um, since the school impact fee was established, we've collected roughly $4 million towards um, school facilities and have been consistently using that towards debt service. Um, I think particularly on the high school debt, but that's something Tom finance, chief of finance and director know better than I. <coughs> Transportation impact fees, which shows the quantity that we've collected over the years. Um, the Payne Road area, you know, roughly two and a half million dollars. That's been in place the longest. Um, Dunstan Corner, you know, close to six hundred thousand dollars. Again, that's going towards debt service on uh, the town's investment in Dunstan Corner. Oak Hill and Haggis, uh, Haggis Route 1 intersections. And I mentioned earlier, we get recreation contributions in many cases from development that go to community services. Um, sometimes it's open space or amenities within neighborhoods like trails, eastern trail contributions, etc. instead of that. So that's kind of the background on growth management and impact fees. And I know this is a lot to absorb, but now I kind of want to transition to sort of the newer housing dynamics um, and provide a little bit of background on this. So our current comprehensive plan, so it's 10 years old at this point, in 2006, identified the need to really kind of broaden our choices and types of housing. So we were dominantly single family for decades. Um, so that was highlighted in the comp plan, affordable housing, uh, multiplex housing, um, you know, accessory units have become very popular um, in the last 10 years, and other types of housing choices and, and neighborhood styles. So since then, the Long Range Planning Committee and the Council have been working steadily on implementing the zoning to, to execute the comprehensive plan. So um, now, in our zoning ordinance, there's a variety of types of neighborhoods, variety of types of housing that are permitted. And now we're seeing the housing market, um, people's lifestyles and economics really starting to drive demand for housing diversity, particularly multifamily housing so and multifamily living. Um, so I guess it's not a big surprise that we're, we're seeing an influx of different housing types, including multifamily. And this isn't scientific, but it's more anecdotal. But Millennials, singles, and empty nesters in particular are interested in one and two bedroom housing types and, um, and units versus larger, uh, larger housing types in, in single family homes. And they're increasingly interested in attached housing and, and rental housing. And there's, there's developers in, in the audience that probably can speak more uh, specifically about this, but um, that's a trend we're seeing and it's, it's sort of well documented in the region and the nation for, for that matter. And I guess the last point is developers are responding. So this is responding to, to kind of market demand and also what the zoning is allowing. Just one point to be aware of and sensitive to, that's not a, a bottomless pit. There'll be absorption in the market and they'll be satisfied at some point. I think that's the big question in the minds of the developers is Where's the bottom? And wanting to get their project online and available while the demand is there. And I don't have the answer to that, but I think that's part of the motivation we're hearing from the development community that they want to get moving on this because the uh, the trends might be changing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, do we have any uh, Greater Portland data, or other than outside of Scarborough? Because I mean, we've got obviously like in Westbrook's been in the news a lot lately with big development projects. Um, you know, are, is there some way to kind of couch where we are versus Westbrook, Gorham, and the surrounding Greater Portland areas. Yeah, just Karen, do you want to speak to that? There's a little factoid on the, the second bullet on the fact sheet on sure. the market demand. Yeah. So, so what we what we've learned from looking at um, what's happening in Portland specifically is uh, Portland's rental vacancy rate is about one percent. 
Um, and one of the things that they're faced with is, um, until recently, really for about 20 years, there hasn't been any rental units built in the city of Portland. So there's a little bit of catch up too, you know, because there hasn't been a lot built. Um, you know, there's some high end condominiums being built, but not that many being built for um, rentals. Recently, though, you know, the queue in in Portland. Um, last I read, I think it, this is from a you know Press Herald story. Um, probably about 800 units in the queue. Half of those are the Federated project, which I, I think is is I think is done being. Um, Discussed and is on the table, so there is there's there's a lot of multifamily development uh, being proposed throughout the region, and what we've seen uh, um, is you know there's a an analysis that said region wide there's about 4,000 uh, more single family owner occupied housing houses being. Um, a gap in a market of about 4,000 units, and there's a specific gap of about 2,000 um, units in the rental market for market rate apartments. But that's a very narrow forecast. That was through 2018. So in another two years, um, you know, the demand will keep changing. And one of the things that, that we looked at um, is not just the the housing demand is not always coming from people just moving into the region. Um, even if we look at household sizes, for instance, if we if we took, like I ran some numbers. These are not anywhere. These are just you know numbers that we ran because we just got a, um, a large dump of data from the feds for 2015 through the American Community Survey. Even if the population didn't change at all, if 20 percent of our um, family households had one child move out and start their own household. That was a demand of about 400 new households. So even a population not changing at all, you get a demand for new units. Now that's not all that's driving it. Um, I think it's hard to get some of the adult children out of the home um, at this point. But eventually, <laughs> the they're going to move exactly. If Put their suitcase a, if, on the sidewalk. Yes, yeah. You know, if there are enough units, if there's some flexibility in the marketplace, then you do see some of the uh, more household formation from the kids. But there's also household formation just from um, the baby boomers changing their demand for housing, what they want. There's um, transitional housing, you know, maybe you're there for two years while you're building a new home or you're transitioning into um, a senior facility but you're not ready to go yet. Um, so there's a lot of demand in that market. Um, you know, probably Rocky or some of the others have done magnificent market studies and probably tell us more about um, the details. But from what we've seen, there really is a, a demand out there um, related to um, really the rental market. So I think that's a good analysis for the Portland area. I'm, I'm curious to know right. what's South Portland doing to, mm -hmm. to make some right. of that gap up. What's Westbrook doing? What's right. Storm doing? Because if we've got 4,000 mm -hmm. units, let's say, and we're doing, they're doing 800 and right. South Portland's doing 1,000, right. you know, and we're looking at just adding up the numbers here, we're, we're looking at probably, what, six, 700 or something, if not more. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> so I'd be curious to know, I'm curious to know what kind of a, from a regional perspective, mm -hmm where things are going, and, and not necessarily to be, the timing of those, obviously, to your point, Tom, is, is important. So um, if, if we're going to jump in and uh, obviously the first one build out is usually the first one filled, um, but I still would like to know kind of what mm -hmm. we're doing as a region. Um, if, if we could get something like that, I don't know we'll get that. But. And, and, and I guess I'm troubled by, is, is it kind of the, the tail wagging the dog here? I mean, I, I understand that's why builders want to build those units because that's where the demand is they will make money building those but at some point I think we as a town need to think what type of growth do we want what type of communities do we want so I think it allow, instead of allowing developers press us into this market opportunity we need to balance what do our constituents want in our community what do we want and that's got to be part of this planning process right. it's and I think for years I mean having been on the council way back, 
I mean, there's always been that not wanting, the general population is not wanting multifamily housing in Scarborough. And the other component of it certainly is what affect does it have on the numbers of children in school? And I think, I think Rocky uh, gave a figure of tw only 12% of those that rent uh, spaces, I think that right, 12% uh, have children. Um, so that the impact on schools <laughs> Is not is not a heavy impact. But those are the those were the have been the proverbial concerns of the general populace of Scarborough over the years that I've. I'm just there. concerned because I feel like we're we're missing this middle piece. I feel like we have these great magnificent homes in this in our in our town, and we've got you know some apartments or maybe we're missing the end piece. We've got some apartments that are trying to be built that are still in this higher range. You know, what about these families that do have children and do need to go into an apartment? I do, I do think there is a need for that. And I just don't think we're, I don't, I still haven't seen nothing that hits that yeah, demographic. I'd also be maybe curious to know what the lifespan of what some of these projects are. I mean, if it's a multi-family unit, uh, multiplex is it uh, get a 25 year lifespan before it you know major maintenance or renovations or something like that? I, mean, I, I know a lot of it depends on construction and the type and that kind of stuff but you know if there's some kind of data out there that says if we if you do sure, a, we can find that out. I, you mean, know, I would expect the performer would be based on 25 to 30 years kind of okay. useful useful life that's typical but. and I'd, it'd be interesting to, to see what in the past what or towns have done when those expire out mm -hmm. um, is there you know, I don't know how you would address that. But, it's, uh, it's worth noting Foxcroft and Coach Lantern are two good examples. They're mm -hmm. 25 to 30 years old yeah. themselves. They've just been richly purchased at a premium price. I might mm -hmm. add, right. I think uh, it's a 15, one million dollar yeah. acquisition of those two, and you're going to see a, a full reinvestment back in those properties. Mm -hmm. Right, so they're re renovating yeah. all just, of them. Right, and yeah. yeah, just for example, yes, Foxcroft has uh, built in 1981. And in fact, the per unit price just for Foxcroft um, was about 160,000 a unit, somewhere in there. So it was there, and the reason it's it's they were willing to pay that much is because it multifamily is a business when it's a rental. So they're paying not only the price of the unit, but they're buying a business. They're getting this incredible return. Those units are generally full, so you know they they are they are worth a lot of money to someone. And I guess that's great as long as the markets continue to go up. If we run into another recession later on, I'd, I'd be curious to know what a, what some of the other communities have done with excess multifamily mm -hmm. housing stock when it's gone or when it's when, well, if it, the market falls out. It, it, it hits the performance and probably uh, affects the the profit margin. But the beauty sure. of rental housing is you can modify your rents to fit the market. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I can't think of too many rental units that are shuttered up because of condition. They I find would think a way to keep them going. So, yeah. so what we'd be looking at is if whatever adjustments or change we make, we want to consider this as a long term. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's going to turn over in 25, 30 years and we'll look back at it again. Typically, I'm not saying you never say never to anybody, but it, it's, mm -hmm. that's going to be kind of. Yeah, I don't know if we can answer those questions. I mean, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, the, uh, developers are putting serious money. We're talking yep. 30 to $40 million in some of these projects. They are assuming a lot of risk in doing so. Um, and I don't know how we can probably get some insight from them as to what their thought process is, but they're the ones that are doing that market study that are aware of what else is going on in the region um, and are assuming the risk is part of the project. Yeah. Karen, do you have uh, data on Foxcroft for uh, the number of children they have per unit? We did. And in fact, I think we, we looked at those, um, I think we got them from the weeks. We got them from the school department and they looked at the bus stops because they have um, unique bus stops for Foxcroft. And for 104 units, there were nine children. How about the other one? Uh, it's nine school aged children. Um, Coach Lantern I'm, um, was a little bit more. I think there were about 30 children for Coach Lantern. How many units? How many units? Uh, that was 90. Can you, um, who? I'm just confused by one thing on this. Um, the project that are listed, they say it represents approved projects. Who's approved these projects? The planning board. They've gotten all their 
development. But they haven't come before the council. They don't need to. No, they don't they have, have to. to. No, I mean, that's the thing to keep in mind. You, the council has done the land use piece. All of these projects can happen, but for some technical issues that we'd like to get through to tonight if possible. But the underlying zoning uh, is an upgrowth from the comprehensive plan, and this sort of diversity in housing was a very clear theme throughout that plan, which was fully developed with community input. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of to Karen's point, too, in this discussion about types of projects, um, not all these projects are the same. I think that's an important mm -hmm. distinction, and also that kind of drives market and demand and who wants to be in these these projects. Um, Dunstan Crossing and has planned for multifamily housing since you know 2006, 2007. It's always been part of their package. They finally got into the phase where they would have multifamily housing. Um, and that setting is some multifamily units near you know, a restaurant, coffee shop. It's sort of a mixed-use project, a little community. Um, that's different than you know, the Griffin Road project that was approved by um, the planning board and the council approved, approved the TIP. That's an independent yeah, we'll elderly yeah. project that's very different than um, Dunstan Crossing. Yeah, yeah. The Avesta project um, was approved by the council through a contract zone, also has a TIF. That's, I think, um, Kate, maybe to your point, that's affordable housing mm -hmm. that has one, two, and three bedroom units. So if we're looking at but they just having, changed. They just added the three bedroom. Right. And there's only like two of them, right? I think there's more. I think oh, there okay. Is, it's at least a third as. Because in the original scope of the plan, there was not any three bedrooms. Right. right. Correct. So they wanted to shift it to have, to address families and have you know more accommodation for uh, family affordable housing. Okay. As you know, that's also an historic preservation yeah. project. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, those are all, again, different than a couple multifamily projects that are, say, more luxury, more kind of high-end that want to be in commercial areas or near commercial areas, is that's becoming pretty popular, to be close to shopping, close to employment, so they're not on top of neighborhoods, you know, a butter issues aren't that big of a deal, um, they're kind of, instead of commercial development that right now is quite sluggish around you know, retail and office, there isn't a good market for it right now. Um, so multifamily housing, at least these kind of more high-end um, projects, could be a decent stand-in for, for what otherwise could happen. So kind of getting back to why we're talking about growth management ordinance is really the kind of this reserve pool. Um, I mean, the zoning is in place for a lot of these projects. It's a diverse list of projects, and we have some pretty robust kind of impact fees to kind of handle the impacts of these projects. It's really more about kind of the pace of how they build out and what's appropriate for that piece of development. You know, these are different than single family homes where you do 10 to 15 units a year. Multifamily is you're building a 12 unit building or you're building a 20 unit building at once. So you need to get growth permits in bunches, not one at a time. It's kind of very different than our growth management ordinance is set up. Our growth management ordinance is predicated on what we've seen historically right. um, in terms of more single family development. So the reserve pool today, again, outside of this annual allocation. The reserve pool has 215 permits and that's been just sitting there. And since 2008 we haven't needed to draw from it as you were asking Bill. Um, and it's reserved for kind of these special projects, projects that meet our zoning incentives or projects that really don't work under the annual allocation and qualify um, in the growth management ordinance. And um, most of these projects qualify for the reserve pool. It hasn't been in demand. It's now in demand. Um, and so in the growth management ordinance, it says the council monitors the permits in the reserve pool. You, you keep track of those. If they're being drawn from, um, you talk about replenishing them. Um, and there's actually a mandatory requirement that at 50, you get down to 50 reserve pool permits, 
that says the council has to talk about it. So we're not at 50, but we don't want to <laughs> create a situation where a project's asking for permit 49 and we're not ready for it. So that's why we're really kind of talking about some reserve. Just as an aside, the growth management ordinance originally, uh, remember the 135 annual application, it originally was set up that uh, unused permits below 135 were swept into this. Right. Uh, but we changed that in states. It rolls to the next year. Yeah. Rolls to the next year. So this uh, surplus is a static number and needs to be changed or replenished by the council. Right. You're, you're the only ones that have the authority. To do Why that. was that sweep removed? <coughs> there was, that was the council policy decision in 2008. Um, I, believe in, I wasn't here for the conversation, but I believe in 2001 when the original growth management ordinance was negotiated, there was a lot of concern about all the inventory of development that wanted growth permits. Mm -hmm. So they were actually grandfathered. If they'd already been approved, they didn't have to get a growth permit. And it was also, I think, discussed and decided that at that time, they should roll from one year to the next because 135 was decided to be, this is the town can handle with good planning, fiscal planning, 135 permits a year. So if one year it's low and they're made up the next year, it's still averaging 135. Yeah. In 2008, the decision was um, instead of using that, let's have a reserve pool to deal with the slush or deal with the unexpected projects. So it was just a policy decision. So Dan was being dipl very diplomatic when he characterized negotiation, as you might expect. The development committee was intensely interested in this first conversation of road management. Many of the people in this room lived through those conversations. Some were pleasant, I suspect. Uh, but I think after some time and experience, and we were able to show that actually the annual allocation was sufficient to meet demand, there was some level of comfort uh, and kind of retooling how we did this. Yeah, right. I, I think I was on the council at the time, and just, we, we didn't want to go through a 1980s again. You know, to have you know, a sudden rush and you know, massive amounts of I, development. I said, I don't, want to be, I don't want either. Those high school years were bad for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. So I kind of <laughs> get into the reserve point considerations. This is kind of the next step is, is Understanding school and municipal service impacts is something the council wants to think about as you consider reserve, replenishing reserve pools. Growth management ordinance is in place to moderate impacts on schools principally, but also other services. So if the reserve pool is replenished, then you want some confidence that it's not going to overly impact the schools and other services. So. That's where we've done some initial work around understanding, better understanding <coughs> these one and two bedroom multifamily projects and how that relates to that. Um, and so we've been trying to look at forecasted school municipal demands and how that plays to the growth management ordinance. Likely valuation, that's a pretty big piece of this. The value of these projects in terms of the ROI of a multifamily project, a contemporary multifamily project. And then Karen's going to talk a bit about sort of economic development, how that plays into these types of projects. Dan, when, when yeah. also, I mean, we've had prior conversations, at least in the transportation community, where you've got Oak Hill intersection, you've got Dunstan Corner, which are pretty much maxed out on their traffic volume they can handle now okay. during peak hours. And I guess there is not a lot, we've invested a lot of money when you saw the the impact fees on what we've collected, that's probably been more than burnt in trying to re-engineer those intersections. So is that also being factored into this impact? What, wherever these units are going to be, what impact they're going to have on Gorham Road and Oak Hill and Dunstan Corner? Right. It is, I mean, it, that's a key piece of the equation, obviously. Yeah. And, and but but yeah. I, I didn't hear yeah. you mention it, so I'm just wondering if that's yeah, part of Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about <laughs> that. I mean, with... Two of the projects, um, one considered, <coughs> being considered an enterprise business park and another being considered an highest parkway. Um, these multifamily projects, the, kind of the interesting thing about it is that, like you talked about earlier, there's not a lot of market right now for office development, retail development at a scale that is that meaningful. 
Um, and those two sites are already approved for commercial development. And they already have kind of traffic permits. They already have a, gotten approval for a certain amount of traffic impact in the community. Um, so it's, in some ways, it's trading one use for another. You know, the impacts are been permitted <laughs> for but commercial. Um, so multiple <coughs> is actually less than commercial in most cases. In but terms of I think we're going to address a lot of that, i.e., when, when we look at doing the new comp plan, looking at other alternatives for transportation, i.e., increasing the mass transit. You increase the mass transit and you lower the individual vehicles. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we need to think of as we put together the next comp plan to expand it out to say, you know, what can we do with traffic? You know, if you increase bike lanes, maybe more people will use their bikes. And if you have more buses, they're going to use the buses, really kind of park and ride. And so that's what we need to be doing as we do all of the comp plan revision. Do, do we have data that tells us whether uh, Multifamily housing places a greater burden on uh, on our roadway system and our intersections than commercial property because these properties we're talking about for the largest number are zoned as mixed use. They could be both. Mm -hmm. We do. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Is, is that. So a yeah. quick question. So I guess I've heard it thrown on a couple times. You know whether it's a commercial <coughs> project or a residential <coughs> or, you know, project. What determines? which set of zoning ordinances apply? Is it just the zoning that it's going into to determine whether it's a commercial project or a residential project, or the fact that it's multi-unit housing automatically falls under a residential kind of zoning requirement? The, um, in the last few years, because particularly the highest Parkway zone hasn't seen the development that the town envisioned 15 years ago. You know, office parks are, I don't want to say dead, but they're, um, not elderly. <laughs> and, um, Thanks to Jeff Messer. So there, there's not a demand right now for office development, <coughs> that type of development at the scale envisioned in that area of town. So the town has been incrementally broadening what can happen behind these parkways. So the broadenings three years ago was allowing multifamily housing if it's part of a larger project um, that also has commercial. So Enterprise Business Park, again, it had really good first five, eight years. A lot of small, great, um, small and mid-sized businesses went in there, and then it dried up. And so they're considering multifamily housing on the other half of their project, and that works under zoning, because we said you could have multifamily as part of that type of project. Um, the Gateway Square site that the infrastructure is in off of Highest Parkway, or the former Gateway Square site, Infrastructure's in, it was laid out for an office park, hotel, some retail. Um, it's been sitting there. And retail looked at it and has decided not to move forward there just based on its variety of factors. Um, and so that's a zone that allows multifamily if it's part of a larger project. They're going to come <coughs> to the council the contract zone and say, we want to do multifamily. On that site, we might be able to do some commercial, but we can't meet the zoning expectations there. And we think it, you know, they're going to say we think it's a good use for the site. That project's already been permitted. They actually put in turn lanes for um, traffic capacity. They improve the intersection at the interchange at the uh, exit 42. So, I mean, traffic wise, that's already pretty much ready for any type of development that could happen there. Um, so, you know, it's kind of instead of commercial, it's it's potentially multifamily. And the next slide sort of shows what the trip differences are. Before you go um, off that slide, though, the ten percent or less <coughs> occupied by school-aged children, can can we get an idea what uh, the region towns that are like ours, whether it's Yarmouth or Falmouth or South Portland or what do you do? Cape doesn't probably have much, but. Uh, <laughs> What all those towns are doing as far as their multifamily ratio of children so that we, I think we need to have a more confidence uh, well, just, just that, that the, that the data. Well, just the ones, the two that she mentioned were completely different. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, you might want to. I think you have to be careful, too. Bus stop numbers don't necessarily translate into full right. uh, enrollment right. because right. if Lots you look at the high school in the morning, what, yeah. what percentage right. of the kids are actually taking that bus? Right. We've triangulated, if you will, back to this number. We looked at state statistics, state uh, national point, statistics. Right. We've heard from actual projects, developers doing projects locally. Yeah. We think that number is actually uh, quite conservative. Likely to be less than 10 percent. These are but one and two bed. There's a big difference between a one bedroom multifamily and a three bedroom multifamily. It's night and day in terms of school age kids. Um, but Dan, just just that that's kind of a little bit misleading. On low contributor to school population, they pay impact fees. But if you take just the fee. you take the 854 units that have already been applied, uh, approved. That's on this sheet. Well, they Projects have, approved. approved. Well. 600 of them have not. Uh, well, the, the total on here goes to 854, so if we just use that number, you know, at 10 percent, that's 80 students. So we get $80,000 in impact fees, but the annual cost of education is a million dollars. So, yes, there's impact fees, but there's... But, but I think the point you're missing... Yeah, yeah, I think the point you're missing is they're well, paying taxes every year, too. That's well, but, the operational cost of the school. Right, but, but I, what would be good to have, I think, is as we move down this pathway is to look at that and know what, what is the total revenue, both from see, real estate. They don't cost a million dollars. But what is the incremental cost? Because it's the incremental cost. Well, but what That's is that? A, it's a marginal cost increase analysis, not just take $12,000 per student right, times but, each student. That's, but that's we, just incorrect. But do we know what the incremental? So we should know that. But, we should know that. But, but, but is but the we, incremental? That can be known. Right. And we that's, should. that's not that hard to figure out, but it's a fraction. Of twelve thousand, but we should. Those should be. All I'm saying is, don't throw out a million dollars when that has no bearing well, on what. So, it, so I but, think that um, over the course of the conversation, it's been clear that we want further analysis about the cost impact as well as the fee structure and the impact related to that. Because while we can segment and talk about the impact of schools, the fact is, and we've seen it, there's greater impact to other services when you yeah. don't have children. So whether it's community services for seniors public transportation for renters and people who don't have the transportation. So I think that we need to do a broad, uh, broad scope of what is the impact analysis and looking at all of them. So I do have that as a follow-up to ensure that they I, I just that. think it's important, though, to recognize that the impact fees are designed for infrastructure costs, not for operational costs. Right. So, so that when the impact fees, when we're talking about school impacts or facilities impacts, that's what the property tax generation is for, for plowing, well, not sometimes plowing, but plowing the major roads. Yeah. Traffic and you know traffic close to whatever it is. And by law, we yeah. cannot have impact fees that are targeted to that target to the yeah. ongoing operational costs. They are limited. Yeah, but no, no, but we have the right. We have to have the right analysis. Though. Right. Yeah. To, yeah, to clarify on impact fees, though, it's not. We don't analyze whether there's a school kid that's going to go in a rental unit or not. So it's it's a one thousand eighty dollars per, per unit, unit right. regardless. Right. So it's not. 80 school kids, $80,000. It's 80 school kids, $850,000. Now, if there's 850 units, the town's getting $850,000, regardless of the percent of school kids. I guess that's just a question. Yeah, that's a big one. We need some of the other numbers. That's spread out over the units, so it's not. You know, yeah. It's per unit, yeah. regardless yeah. of yeah. what the actual contract is. Wait, did you just say, Chris? It's it's you know, it's, a it's 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 like an insurance pool, right? So if, if everybody has to contribute, so if there are three kids there, if there's three kids there. If there's 20 kids there, it doesn't matter. The same values coming out of that that impact that 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 uh, fee. So per unit, it all comes out of the wash. Right. So right. And, and let's not forget that that um, you know the at least the the highest Parkway it hasn't that one will come before you, and it, it's going to be part of their uh, presentation to talk about what they anticipate and. Um, really talking about the market demand and everything else. Well, I think I think I think as a counselor, when you sit down and you're presented with this material, and the first thing you know, we're reading through this stuff, and the first thing we look at is that there's almost 900 approved projects. No, I'm just saying that's what it looks like, though, when we look at this spreadsheet that was put before us. It says represents approved projects, and when you add up that number without getting we didn't have the information when we first sat down. It starts your mind reeling of like, wait a minute, hold on. There's a whole slew of things that need to go on to be able to support something like this, including our three, schools. The first three were. Yeah, the first sure. yes. three. Yeah, our start. It's those are the, right. the first three. Are. Of the total 127, right. the rest are in the pipeline. Right. But I just like that. This was the first 
that I was hearing about a lot of these projects. So it's, in, it's intimidating as a counselor because we're not just thinking of building the units. We have to think about every single thing that goes along with it. So it is overwhelming when you sit down and see the numbers like that because we do have to think about the schools, we do have to think about the transportation, we do have to think about what it's going to do to our town and what it's going to make our town look like. I mean, those are important things. So. And that's why we're here. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've been trying to understand these without getting into particulars yeah. of the projects. Right. And but I also think we're working with, a, with an ordinance that's seven years old that, um, you know, seven years ago this town was a lot different than it is today. We're, we're growing and changing, and we talk, we've talked about, I think I've said this a couple times now, we're not just a, we're not, Bill and I talked about this, we're not just a, a town anymore, we're almost a small city. And so we have to be very careful with things like this. Just keep in mind, we are the exception rather than the rule when it comes to growth management ordinances, much less impact fees. Someone mentioned Westbrook, uh, they have a moratorium, and what they're looking at is putting in the growth management ordinance and impact fees. Yep, so we are so far ahead of the curve. Yeah, I'm just saying it doesn't hurt to look at, if we're, if we're considering all of these things, it doesn't hurt for the ordinance committee to go back and look at that ordinance to see if there are areas that we might need to tweak. That's just my opinion. So, and I, I don't want to bring it back around to the zoning and maybe we don't need to address this now, but um, looking at these projects, Dan, how many of these would you say require a potential contract zone or a zoning amendment based on um, one you know, just one, only one? The Haggis Parkway okay. project that's listed last. Yep. Um, But they are, in a, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they are limited to that one place that has a cap like everybody else, or no, they're not. They qualify for the reserve pool. Okay. All of them qualify but, for the reserve pool, but there's not adequate. But that's a one-time reserve pool once that goes away because we're not sweeping in. Once that right. one or two projects could eat that up, uh, the remaining <laughs> projects we'd have to decide, do they get in the queue again and postpone them, or do we do... That's the question, right? Do we do another reserve pool, or do we do you put them back in the queue? Pool? And they, these projects are understandably interested in the upfront assurances that when they want to pull permits, they're available to them. And that's a very real concern that... Um, and that's understandable. ...why we're here. Yeah, and we realize there's a lot. We're, we're talking about the history of growth management. We're talking right. about impact fees. We're talking about multifamily trends and now the reserve pool. So this is a lot of information. And I think what we're trying to parse out here is, and we're still kind of going, is a one-bedroom multifamily unit is very different than a four-bedroom single-family house. And so we have a growth plan and ordinance that is set up principally for three and four-bedroom single-family houses. And we're now seeing one-bedroom, two-bedroom multifamily units. And then we need to understand <coughs> what that means for the growth management ordinance and what it means for municipal impacts and also value for the town. But, so. but to your earlier point, though, in a multi-unit, uh, they count as a percentage of the one growth credit, correct? It's not like one single-family home swaps out for a one-family yeah. rent. It's a half a unit. Right. For, for one bedroom. Right. A two-bedroom, I'm assuming, is the full. It's a point six seven. And a point six seven. Okay. Thank you. Right. So it seems, seems like that your <laughs> slide is a transitional slide to move us into what is being requested, or at least yes. where, where we're going. Maybe if we can, can Dan, I can go to that? Dan. Just one yes. quick, one <laughs> quick response to the councilor's uh, last point in terms of the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Just want to let you know that the Long Range Planning Committee has taken a very, very hard look at how the current ordinance is structured today to try to assist you in making the right decision. Um, as, as we move forward. But, I mean, we're spending a tremendous amount of time right now on that as a as a whole to try to give you some, you know, a, a smoother uh, impact to you as counselors when when you are, have to address it. Thank you. One quick question I have for you. Uh, do, do we have an idea of when that contract zone is going to come on the schedule? The schedule is next month? Sorry. I've been, I've been holding this back literally for months, uh, as I said, so uh, I just can't hold it any longer. So, just for... Move on. Move on. Okay. So, 
We've talked a lot about traffic, and I think a few counselors were curious about traffic comparison. Um, this is our best way of comparing, where a one unit yeah. roughly compares to a thousand square feet of office or retail. So office is generally two p.m. peak hour trips, so the busy time of the day. Two car trips go to um, excuse me, two. Car trips are gener generated by a thousand square feet of office. Retail is very high, at, as you experience on Payne Road. Um, over 10 trips per a thousand square feet of retail in the peak hour of the day, which is usually the, the afternoon commuter hour. Single family homes is a little bit over a trip per unit. Multi families, a little bit more than half a trip. So, thinking about office, retail, commercial areas, you know, Gateway Square <coughs> is going to generate, if, say that goes to multifamily housing, it's going to generate a lot less traffic than what would have gone there um, a few years ago that was planned. Um, same would be for enterprise. But it's still additional traffic. It's still to, over Additional today. traffic sure. to today, in today's the problem, so. Absolutely. I'm just not something to consider. Yeah. Just, yeah. just something to consider. Just when you put your transportation committee in. <laughs> if you compare it, compare the two, that's the um, in terms of valuation, and Karen probably can speak to this better, certainly can speak to this better than I, um, as mentioned, the recent projects that sold um, Foxcroft and Fox Lantern and their value, um, looking at um, similar projects, um, these, multi these larger multifamily projects are very comparable to commercial development in terms of valuation. Gateway Square site, you know, it's probably in the 30 to 35 million dollar range. 27 to 45 is what it puts yeah. up there. This might be a better question for Tom. What are they? What's the tax rate that they're assessed at? Is it a commercial property or is it a residential or is it different? The same. It's, 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 it's all the same. Right. There's different approaches to value. Typically, okay. the uh, there'll be income approaches used, and I would expect in this case, the interesting thing is these are residential uses, but they're essentially commercial projects. Right. Um, yeah, they're. They are they treat that like that are financing. So there would be an income approach to value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what the charge of the rent, how uh, that produces money. As well as well, comps. Do we know yeah, comps too. Right, but the point is it's not, it's not it's the same as a single family home where you just yeah. have square footage and it's X right. per mill rate or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a more complicated all, approach to value. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all intended to be rental units, they're not condos or. To well, well, yeah, that's all not, not yet. They can turn <laughs> that out, but. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah. form of ownership. They could convert that into not, it's not a land, that's not a zoning board, planning board. They can, land any time they can it's, just, it's, it's a dwelling unit. It can be rental or it can be. But what we know about these projects, they are rental at this point. Gotcha. Or anything else. Do we know if there's any kind of difference to the impact or the usage of the analysis based on when it's a rental versus? It's more about bedrooms. It's more about more bedrooms. About the bedrooms. Yeah. yeah, and so when we talk about these kind of valuations and the last it is positive ROI, positive mm -hmm. return on investment in terms of tax value versus service demands. That's not across the board multifamily housing. That doesn't include three bedroom multifamily housing. We're, we're talking more narrowly about one and two bedroom. Um, and so that's there's a clear distinction there. Um, Dan, on the um, third bullet, the 27 to 45, what is the span over time to reach the maximum? Is it three years, five years after the project's been done? Is it, you know, what's their typical span for that? It depends on the build out of the, of the project. But that estimate is based upon the full build exactly. out of the project. Exactly, that estimate's at based the time on the full build out. Okay. Second is that, would we be able to assess um, in any of these projects what the impact is to the valuation for the surrounding area? Because I know that um, there, it impacts other parts. So, as an example, Gateway will impact obviously. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the project, so I'm just going to incorrect the store. But the Capella project that went in, which had a TIF on it, um, have we done any analysis to the other region, you know, kind of a regional? We've not area? looked at that, what, okay. what the impact, other than when we start talking about economic <coughs> impacts, we've looked at what we think some of the economic development impacts are, but not necessarily the impact of valuation. valuation okay. Yeah, I, I don't know how we, we document that, but the, it only stands to reason we put five, four to five hundred people in close proximity. It's going to help vibrancy. And the next slide gets into uh, 
the suggestion that there might be a development catalyst that follows this. That there's no way to document this. So is you tired? <laughs> Dan's tired. So, <laughs> so we, you know, it, it, we've all struggled a little bit with trying to understand, you know, we, we think of these, uh, particularly the Enterprise Business Park and um, I guess Parkway, as really being business um, zones, places that are reserved for business development. So when we went about looking at, all right, well, how does this relate to economic development? Number one, one question is valuation. But there are some other impacts, we think, on um, you know, the economic development policies of the town um, when we talk about multifamily development. And one of the things that um, we've talked about a lot at the SEDCO board and Long Range Planning Committee, you know, is this change in the demand for office. What office development there is doesn't want to be isolated and in, um, you know, uh, traditional business parks. They want to be more part of a community, they want more amenities, they want to feel like things are going on. And that's more than theoretical. I can tell you that in working with um, several prospects, two of them large, 150,000 square feet, they are very clear that they, um, they want to be closer to the community, closer to where there's action, closer to restaurants. They sometimes think of Hyde's Parkway, and I'm just on the phone this afternoon with someone, it feels isolated to us. And so what we're thinking is, all right, fine, let's talk about what multifamily development, what a project of the scale that um, you know, is going to be before you next week does that begin to create some interest in the activity and vibrancy in this Haigas Parkway corridor? And I, you know, a reasonable approach to that is that I think it does start to create some, some vibrancy. I don't, think, um, I don't think we know the, the direct impact, but it certainly contributes um, to some of the issues that we've been hearing from folks as we've been talking with them. Um, We've looked at the value from several different standpoints, and you know we've looked at um, both example projects, you know Cabela's, um, uh, Horizon Solutions, as well as coming at it from a standpoint of you know construction value per square foot of construction. We can get some pretty standard office numbers um, about that, and what we do come out up with is some numbers that are similar. They're similar in nature. They're, um, I, I think it's, I think we, we did uh, compare it in the, um, in the memo, uh, but they're very, they're very similar in nature in terms of that spread. Um, it all depends, like it does in any type of valuation, high end office, high end medical with labs, <coughs> it's got a, a little bit higher value, high end um, residential units with granite countertops and. Um, all of those types of finishes that pushes that res that uh, residential up. I think that the difference that we look at a little bit is is the square footage. Um, we think the residential approach, the multifamily, is probably going to have a little bit more square footage in um, Gateway Square. The commercial development um, we've been using sort of a theoretical build out of about 300,000 square feet. Um, and that's what we based some of our analysis on in terms of getting the, the spreads. Again, so not equal, but pretty comparable in terms of those ranges. But I just want to interject. Uh, that's an important exercise. Mm -hmm. and it was important to understand that. But the reality is we've had 15 years of experience in the parkway, nothing's happened. Right. And the sort of message we're hearing from the development community that re retail of large scale and office is virtually non-existent. And so the likelihood can theoretically do that and say, wouldn't it be nice if we had this development? But the fact is the market isn't there for that. And so it's kind of the bird in the hand conversation. Uh, we've got a project that wants to be there. And the other stuff is theoretical. And I, I'm a little more positive about there. There's some, there are, there are some, <laughs> some projects out there. Um, <laughs> at least, you know, uh, that's what I spend my days trying to. Uh, <laughs> but there are, there are a lot of projects comment. similar to what we're talking about for Gateway Square that are going on in northern New England. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Bedford, New Hampshire is the best example of a wayfarer 
the old Wayfair Hotel site, which yeah. is being redeveloped yeah. with the primary component being housing yeah. and, and with commercial built around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the developments uh, along the seacoast in, in uh, mm -hmm. Portsmouth, Hampton, mm -hmm. again, uh, it, it's housing going in, coinciding with, uh, with commercial development. Isn't the credit like union lot. behind uh, Egg and I there they, the town choose that there? site for that reason? They did. They, cho yeah. they chose that site because it's vibrant. It's close to restaurants. It's it's where they wanted to be. They, they looked at all of these other areas. Yeah. Um, they wanted some to some give their employees, employees options. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. They wanted to give their employees options. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like part of their whole scheme of you know, even inside their building and how they work and, you know. Um, but I've heard the same comments about Haggis Parkway is that it feels almost cold. Yeah, I see. So, you know, I, I, again, we, we think that there's a role for multifamily in creating this interesting and, um, you know, hopefully inviting corridor. Uh, the, the next thing that is definitely, you know, it's a policy um, issue throughout the state, throughout the region and right here in Scarborough is this, you know, um, issue of workforce. And right now, the unemployment rate in Scarborough, in the city of Portland, which generally has traditionally had a higher unemployment rate, and the county is like 2.7, 2.8%. .8%. And that's, you know, we're, we're starving our businesses. When I look at um, you know, pick any of the job sites out there. I think we, we pulled the stats from Indeed. There were 90 jobs in Scarborough, and I took out all the stuff that looked like it was made up, like the stuff that looked like you're really working for yourself and it wasn't really a job. Um, so I took out all of those, and I had 90 jobs and 60 different companies in Scarborough actively looking and in all types of jobs um, you know there's certainly a lot of uh, medical uh, service providers uh, I should say the the administrative part of, of the medical offices but Sun Life was advertising Hannaford was advertising so these are executive positions so again I don't mean to no pun intended belabor the issue there but um, we do feel that um, housing plays a role in that. It doesn't solve the issue, but it does provide, it does play a role in the development of workforce. And we're playing a regional role there too. And one of the things that we certainly hear, you know, is the logistics of Scarborough, particularly Hygis Parkway, are great. And those same logistics apply to residents as well as, um, you know, the businesses because you've got two worker households going in different directions. So there's a lot of, of uh, uh, you know, quality to the, to the location of Pagas Parkway for uh, some of the residents. I'm sensitive to time, so maybe we can wrap this up. Sure. And I just want to make sure we get some discussion Absolutely. going around the table as well. We've talked about it a little bit. We create opportunities for transit. And, you know, you can't help but say if you've got, um, you know, 300 units going in on Highgate Parkway, you know, we're really sparking some demand for goods and services for our um, existing businesses, and hopefully um, driving some additional business growth. Yeah. Covered a lot of territory. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is sort of our summary slide, and then uh, we have a final slide for next steps. Um, you know, as we covered, we have a growth management ordinance. Um, it hasn't been taxed heavily in the last eight years. You know, it's been working fine given that it's was set up for the type of development we've been seeing. And it's really there to kind of pace housing construction that has had historically big impacts on schools and, and also municipal services. So it's in place. Um, but now we need to look at the reserve pool. Um, we've had zoning and we've sort of strategically established it to allow for a wide range of housing. You know, and we're, we're seeing, frankly, all the housing options that we originally zoned for. We still see strong single family development. We're seeing um, now townhouse development, and we're now seeing some multifamily. So we're, you know, the, we kind of have, we've allowed the market to 
to deliver, um, I guess, under our zoning. And it's, it's, we've talked a lot about these one and two bedroom multifamily developments, and that's really what we're talking about as it relates potentially to the reserve pool. And I know I'm sure more analysis is needed, but initial analysis suggests that it's, frankly, it's more similar to kind of office style commercial in a lot of ways. It's similar in value. It's similar in service demands. It's being relatively low, and some, moderate in some areas, but relatively low. And it looks to have a pretty strong positive ROI. And again, we're talking about one and two bedroom. We're not talking about every multifamily housing type out there. Um, but the smaller units with smaller occupants seemingly have low impacts on the schools and the community. And so that kind of leads us to this reserve pool. And it, it exists strategically for kind of special projects, for projects we've been incentivizing through zoning, and also for projects that don't fit well under kind of the typical um, application of our annual allocation, kind of typical residential that you've seen. So um, it's there. It's there to be used, but it doesn't have capacity for what's what's in the pipeline, what's either approved or allowed under zoning. Um, so that's why we're feeding you all this information. Uh, <coughs> probably feeling like you're, a lot of stuff's coming at you. So this is really a orientation to the issue, the past, etc. cetera. Um, and these are kind of the next steps that we see. Uh, yeah. Maybe I can ahead. speak to these. So it's uh, on, on the agenda next week, we just received the full package today, is uh, a contract zone request. Um, again, these two big projects uh, meet the zoning. They don't need any kind of the underlying zoning is fully intact. There's one little hitch for the Gateway Square, former Gateway Square project that uh, Dan referred to earlier. There's a requirement in HP zone, which that is, uh, having a 60-40 ratio to commercial uh, residential. I see Will nodding. I remember him asked, raising a question about that uh, when the HP zone discussion was being had around multifamily. And obviously this project uh, can't meet that requirement, so they're looking for relief of that piece. And uniquely, there is a contract zone in place. They're not creating one. They're looking to amend it to enable this project to go forward. Um, Fairly quickly after that, the other project, and frankly, Gateway Square would be equally benefit, uh, is a conversation around uh, replenishing or adding to uh, the growth, uh, the reserve pool, to give these projects confidence to move forward. And I would envision that coming fairly shortly uh, in the new year, probably January, February, the very latest. These projects are interested in knowing whether this is viable. So if I could, a couple things I'd like to see too is <clears throat> the um, single family permit requests as well because, um, I mean, the whole point of limiting growth is spraying it out equally over the town. So if we're going to exceed the uh, allotted reserve or something, um, I'd like to know what else is going on outside of the multifamily as well to see kind of where we're at. You mean the pipeline? The pipeline, the pipeline for single family as well. Um, the other question I had too was, I don't know what capacity, and it's kind of an offhand question, but I don't know what capacity the sewage treatment plant is at. Are we near capacity? Are we at capacity? Are we close? So we get a lot of capacity space? Or I'm not saying that that impacts these specifically. I know we have an impact piece for that, but if we have to do a plan upgrade at some point, that's a major capital expense we have to look at as well. All so paid for by exactly. development fees. Yeah. I assure you. That's the thing we hear probably the most complaint about, that we don't control, but mm -hmm. uh, they take very good care of themselves. They make sure they're not caught short. And yeah. Developers in the room, I think, can attest to that. I, I, so I would have no concerns that the, the district would be left short here. Other questions or comments? I, I guess I, Sean, I guess I practice you as chair. I guess this is kind of like, you're right, this is kind of like drinking through a fire hose. And I feel really overwhelmed, and this is the first time I've really seen it. I'm a little bit concerned that we are talking about some pretty significant possible changes down the road, changes in sort of where we are and where we're going. And I'm just thinking this is the Wednesday before, you know, 
this is Christmas holidays. We're, there's going to be something on the agenda next Wednesday night, which is just before Christmas. We're not, our constituents aren't going to be paying any attention. I'm just wondering whether, because we're just getting caught up, they're not caught up. This needs to have more time to percolate. We need more time to get some feedback from our constituents. I'm really nervous about it. I just don't understand why this has arrived at this junction in time with the urgency to, to make this decision in one week. So I would love to ask for more time. I'd love to get some more feedback. And I don't understand if we're doing the comprehensive planning process, why this isn't folded into that process. So it just seems kind of out of sequence. And so I just don't understand that and feel very uncomfortable making any decisions as a counselor based on where we are right now, this information. Picking up on Peter's point, can we get a bit of a time? Because we've got two issues here. We've got a contract zone, and we've got a replenishment of these permits. Uh, and they want to be secure in the belief that they can actually build out the entirety of the project, but they really can't if we don't ever replenish those permits. It could be forever. And so that's, those are the two problems. But the first one we face next week is a contract zone. And Peter's point is, well, wait a sec. We're, we're learning a lot tonight. We'll have it again next Wednesday. Uh, but what is the timeline that, that this contract zone th thing is going to last so that how much exposure? I think the one thing that the public will want us to do is act deliberatively. Peter's point uh, throughout this process so that we make sure we don't stub our toe in anything we do. And so can we get a sure. bit of a... Yeah, the contract zone amendment process is very clear. Should it uh, be successful before the council in first reading, it's referred to the planning board, and it doesn't come back to you until they have uh, actually preliminary approval. So that project is fully scoped and developed and, and has a very high level of analysis and approval before it ever comes back. So our analysis uh, hasn't had the luxury of knowing the particulars of either of those <coughs> projects. We've done it based on uh, a number of other sources that we've looked to. Um, but those details will be known very intimately as part of that process with the planning board. So and I would think February at the earliest it would come back to you, and maybe even later. Depends on how quick they, they work through the planning board process. And can, and can we do further sort of collaborative work, workshop work between now and then and, and get a sense of how the planning board treated with it, maybe meet with the planning board or its leadership. So it, I would just think we'd feel more comfortable if when this comes back, whether it's February or March, which is going to be several meetings of the planning board, uh, that we would be able to be more on top of it because we're talking about a 300-unit project. So yeah. whatever we do on it, we really want to this is a really important thing for us to focus on. Yeah, and my concern is that, you know, and this is nothing against the planning board or long-term planning or anybody else who's been involved in this said co, um, at the end of the day, we're the elected officials that it's going to come down on, and we have to be able to answer for everything that's done. So if we're not comfortable, fully comfortable with it or the process that's happening, then it's our job to slow it down. Can I have two questions and comments? Um, Tom, you, you said there might be two that would have to go to the planning board. Is there another contract? Another contract. Or is there, but the other, the other uh, project is interested in getting certainty around the growth permit. Gotcha. And that's probably has a near term focus. I would, I'm guessing they're going to want something by the end of January, early February. Got it. And the other thing that I heard uh, tonight was that one of the issues that we have is we have the growth ordinance around uh, plan or around, based around single family homes. Um, and maybe what we should be doing is reviewing it in ordinance, the okay. ordinance committee to determine if there's some changes that need to be made um, to accommodate for the, the you know, fairly recent demand in the multifamily. I agree. Because that really picks up on the whole, because the replenishment issue is, is what we're talking about. We have a replenishment program that was put in place when we had a single family uh, explosion single-family house explosion. And now we've got a push for multifamily housing. Right. And maybe there are ways that we can, through the good efforts of our staff, 
town manager, director of planning, be protected against unforeseen <laughs> circumstances as we move forward with the replenishment side of this analysis. Maybe it should be a different yeah. something. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I, <coughs> I would like to about. think that we could be thoughtful and creative and find solutions that meet the needs of the developers who are looking for this, but without creating undue risk that we stepped into something. I think, you know, Alan already said, too, the Long Range Planning Committee is going to be looking at it, too, during this time. So we've, we've already, you know. And, and what is your time frame? Do you, have a, do you have an estimate on when you'd be coming back with recommendation? That's up to the council if you want the Long Range Planning Committee to continue to kind of work on recommendations and analysis, or they could work with ordinance committee, or they could provide, instead of ordinance committee, it's really up to the council as to how you right. want to have subcommittees feed your, feed into your deliberations. Um, We've talked about it not because we knew that there were a couple projects. We did not know that. I think the replenishment issue is a bigger issue than the contract. So I think that's the one that we have to come to grips with. So I have, a qu I have a qualifying question I need to ask before I make a comment. On the first bullet about the uh, contract zone that's being, we're taking up on the 21st, that is not impacted by the reserve pool based upon its current request. It's, it is truly separate. You can get the approval for the contract zone change, and it has no impact on the existing reserve pool. The reserve pool is about replenishing the pool for other projects that are, you know are coming. Yeah. All the... Uh, <laughs> Multifamily projects that qualify have the ability to draw from the reserve pool. The issue is there's only 215 permits in the reserve pool. So it's really which projects go first and use those, those 215, and then which other projects come later and there's no permits so left. Pick it up on so John's point. It's well, the, contra the, the uh, contract zone is only doing away with this 60-40 ratio. Right. It doesn't absolve them from needing, a, needing yeah. the permits. Right. And they would equally benefit from clarity and, and certain, or certainly oh. around that issue, for sure. So the reason I brought that up is really um, I agree with um, the concerns about the process as far as having a deliberative process that is clear and transparent to the citizens as well as to the council because it's such a complex issue. Second is that it's about the, and so our risk as a governing body is to make sure that that is done appropriately and with the confidence of the community. But it's also, even if that takes time, that's the risk that those projects took when they submitted it based upon the number of actual permits that we had. I don't disagree with trying to make an accommodation when it's necessary and it's really um, urgent. Best interest. Um, I'm sorry? And to the town's and it's mostly to the town. That's their risk in submitting their proposal while, you know, so and I understand that it's all business and I know some of that risk is also predicated on the business transaction that they're dealing with with the banks and, you know, being able to secure the financing and the special, you know, the terms and rates and things like that. So uh, I want to make sure that this is a correct process that leads into a more thorough process around comprehensive planning as a whole um, without necessarily um, delaying anything that's truly needed immediately. Unrelated, I was going to hijack if you're if you're finished with your yeah. <laughs> um, do we know anything about the enterprise uh, project? Is that also high end? I I, I, I noticed that the um, the uh, Hagus Parkway was I referenced as high end. Referenced as high end. Yeah, I mean they they consider them luxury apartments and that they come with clubhouses and pools yep. and you know they're they're geared around tenants who who want that kind of lifestyle like a planned community multifamily project that has on-site amenities um, I'd say they're gotcha. comparable got it so one, one place that I was going was something that, that I would consider is that we you know the, the developers want the additional certainty of the permits one of the things that this council has tried to do over a number of years is, is encourage the development of affordable housing. There could be something that we could trade trade there if we were to consider maybe doing some extra permitting in exchange for uh, some affordable units. Mm -hmm. Because it wouldn't have to be uh, units. It wouldn't have to be units. It could be money. Or in in, 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 in fees. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we want to be clear. We're not sort of advocating for one project or another, but uh, we want to. We'd be remiss not to make you aware of an opportunity. And how long that window's open, I don't know. I can maybe get a better sense. Um, but I, I just want to make sure that you appreciate the kind of level of analysis we've gone through um, that we shared tonight. And you're aware of some opportunities, and I don't think that has an endless period. I think there's some time where they'll move on and put their money in place somewhere else. Just one of, That's fine. Just another piece of it is that we don't control when contract zones come in. So it's their right and their application to apply to you. Um, and I think Tom's yeah. trying to actually slow that down so we could have this initial conversation to orient you to a lot of material in that if they came for a contract zone first reading, there would have been a lot of requests in there that kind of needed this explanation. So we want to do this explanation before that contract zone came to you, recognizing we don't have all the answers. So they're, they're going to come in and they're going to explain what they envision this project is and, and I, th I think better explain some of these questions that you have around who are the like what's the likely demographics what are the, what are the finishes of the project what are all the aspects because they have a similar one in um, actually in southern New England that used to be a business park that didn't get off the ground and was converted to this kind of project so it's, it's a very similar context um, and I think that will help you understand some of these things and make decisions from there um, and we're learning at the same time here and we're trying to get up to speed on stuff that that I, they have first-hand experience with. So I think first reading hopefully is better for you because we at least <laughs> introduced all these things and, and I know it's a lot and I know it's you know kind of confusing so we have more work to do on this. So um, and correct me if I'm wrong, it strikes me that the, the real basic concept here is that we, we have an existing growth management ordinance in place it limits it to 135 growth permits per year. Um, with a reserve fund, uh, we have more demand than we have growth permits for potentially, and we're looking at exceeding basically the growth limits that we've set in place by adding more to the uh, reserve fund. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, pretty succinct summary. Yeah. Okay, so then that kind of causes me to come back and say, um, where did the 135 come from? And I'm sure there's a vote on, without the long you know, trials and tribulations of angst of discussion. Um, is that a realistic target? Is that a realistic, does that give us cushion? Um, what are some, are there other growth ordinances out there that change the number of value? Because to me, if I, I, we're going we're, we're gonna to supersede an ordinance, um, and the question becomes is, I think there's a ramification or a repercussion for that. Do we, is it a one-time deal just because we want to take advantage of opportunities now? Or is this going to be now, we're setting a precedent now where mm -hmm. the next number is going to be 150? Just to kind of encourage this kind of... Well, we're not it, talking about the annual fees. We're I talking about uh, the reserve pool. I would say that once we delete that reserve pool, the question, next question is going to be, do we replenish it? And then who gets it? And well, then we how do we... Even it, 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 Chris, and, and to build on to yours, because you always ask the question, have we, what, what are our constituents think? At the beginning, that's why I asked the question. I thought some of that original growth number came from a comprehensive plan process where the community was involved in saying, how do we want to define our community going forward? And they had some concerns. Mm -hmm. It sure seems like me, if we're going to change that number or make some exceptions, we at least need to get our constituents' voice at the table. And it just feels like this process to date, I'm overwhelmed, so I'm sure people at home in the audience that haven't seen these materials are overwhelmed. I'm just not sure we've had enough of a process to get enough input, or at least I know I haven't, because I, I, a lot of people were concerned when they heard this was on the agenda tonight. They're saying, what does that mean? And they heard some of these numbers. So I would like some process by which the public gets a chance to get up to speed and they get to give us their comments. Chris, to your point, are you also suggesting that as part of this analysis, what we really need to be looking at is whether or not the number that's in the, um, not the pool, but the number that's actually in the ordinance, which is 135, should actually be increased to, in essence, absorb that pool going forward so that you don't have to make changes based upon this type of demand. And if we do that, what is the impact of that to the growth? Right. So it's, a, it's about the permanent change to the ordinance of the 135 to a higher that's why I think it. That's why I think it needs to go back to ordinance. I agree. Well, okay. Just keep in mind, what's being contemplated and discussed here was envisioned when this ordinance was created. In fact, you know, the council yeah, that created sure. created yeah. 
hard stops that require the accounts to, to, to actually replenish. So, I mean, what's being asked for is is not. Yeah. We haven't had to do it, mind you. Yeah. And that's what's new and different. But it was always envisioned to be uh, a potential. And we well, always came in under the, the, the ordinance was created with single family homes in mind. Right. 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 These, but for the multi family are very different. But for the reserve pool, the number, I think we didn't have experience to know what that number should be. And now all of a sudden we've got two projects that give that clarity. Yeah, but so in, all, in, in all fairness, though, I mean, right now we have two projects. Next next year we could have five projects. And and the question is, I mean, and I, I get, I'm not, I'm not trying, I mean, I, I understand that's, that's the process we have to go through. I'm not questioning that at all. I just want to make sure that part of, instead of doing the, the quick response to this specific project or... You know, if they're going to supersede the, if they're not going to supersede the reserves this year, there's no problem. It's already done, right? The, the question is going to be if we go no, below that, that reserve, right? It's not that simple for these projects to actually pull the trigger and to move forward. They want the certainty that they'll have permits when they need them, whatever that is. Is it this year? Is it next year? Is it three years? I don't know that answer. But yeah. so there's two things. Too. There's growth management ordinance is about pace of housing development. Right. How quickly. Can certain types of housing developments build? It's not about the character of the community. Zoning is about sort of character of the community. What type of developments do you want to have happen in certain places? What type of housing do you want to have happen here? What type of housing do you want to have happen there? So, and it's hard because these kind of get mixed together, but the growth management orange is the only managing case. How quickly can you get permits? And the reason that was established in 2001 was. So it's principally the schools, because single family housing was causing capacity issues at the schools. So that's why we've talked so much about do you regulate one and two bed multifamily housing? Do you regulate the pace of it if it seemingly doesn't have much impact on the schools? And we need to learn more about that, and that's where the contract zone application and other research can can look at that, but we don't regulate the pace of commercial development. And it has traffic impacts. It has a lot of other impacts. So it's talking about how much do you want to classify multifamily housing like commercial or like single family homes? Because it's not whether it happens, it's how quickly it happens. So those, I guess those are the differences here. And if I can just add, I remember having this conversation back in 2001 when and I, I believe there was a strong concern about um, taking the approach from um, controlling the pace versus um, some opinions about simply prohibiting growth and not allowing new development coming in, which I remember there was some type of legal concern regarding that. So I think that that should be a big part of our conversation because you know we've gone through the years of this, uh, what they call NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard do I want a single family home or a big commercial property or multifamily, whatever. And so I, I want to make sure that as part of this conversation we do look at the legal implications as well about the ordinance, uh, particularly as it relates to trying to prohibit growth versus trying to simply control the pace of it. I look, I'll see if we can find out more about timing to the issue of process. I think in a perfect world we'd all love to uh, spend the time to go through a comprehensive plan, do this at our convenience. Um, unfortunately, there's an opportunity in front of us, and I suspect there's a there's a window in that opportunity. You should be aware that that's there, mm -hmm. and whether or not you want to walk through it or facilitate it, it is entirely up to you. Um, but I don't think it's always going to be there. I don't think a year from now, my strong suspicion is this unit has been built somewhere in the Greater Portland area. They need to be that, and I don't see a sustained interest for this type of development, certainly at this scale. It's a bit of a flash in the pan, responding to some very acute needs right now, and we probably won't see the likes of it for a long time. Again. So, if, if we all kind of agree that we've exhausted our conversation, um, yeah. just a, a closing comment, and then turning it over to the public if they'd like to speak. Um, we have done. We've been here about an hour and forty-five. I did want to suggest because um, I'm not a um, type of person that likes surprises, and I don't think anybody does. I was hoping that if anyone had continuing questions that they wanted to have answered, particularly that relates to the item that's on the agenda for December 21st, as well as the overall issues, is that if you can submit them, we'll make them public so that there's no perception of uh, hidden communications. Um, and I was going to say send them to the town manager 
and then have him publish those questions and then a response. But it also will give the contract, uh, the um, requesters, an opportunity to know so that they can do their research as well as staff to give a thorough answer because it's very hard to do that off the cuff type of fire branding. So before that happens, and I agree with 100%, are we going to get a package with information so that we can? Just, it it just came in today as part of okay. the agenda. I mean, I can make it available. I go back to my office, but it will be part of the agenda. That was the plan. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, obviously, the sooner we get that, the yep. faster we can look at it, faster we can generate questions. I'll and and, before I go on today. and just to make sure, um, so Council Foley had some questions, and I believe they've been answered, but I'll also make sure that you, you I think you've received them. No. I'll make sure you get them to make sure they're included sure if I have fully answered. I'll make sure. I'll make sure she's represented. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, the public and then get any input or any uh, comments from our guests that are here today. So come on up. Um, you should, if you want to go down, can you ask the phone? Well, because we had the speakers and then we had some problems originally. And actually, if you go on. Speakers. The, the oh, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. And if you could just, like our council members, you can state your name and wait, Okay, wait. Su um, Suzanne Foley Ferguson. Um, I just wanted to, first, I have a question, but I just wanted to make a comment. Um, Chris and Peter had mentioned um, to talk a little bit about, you know, where did this number of 135, and I think Judy knows and Rick knows, and we, the, the original comp plan started with an attitude survey that was sent out to every household, every single household, 1999. And it asked, you know, do you want multiplex? Do you want it next to you? Would, would, you know, blah, blah, blah. Is the town doing a good job with open space? This is where we knew that the town wanted to protect open space because some of the questions were geared. And it was professionally done. We didn't have our staff do it in-house. We had it done through an outside consultant. Um, and so the gro then through that, we went through a growth and services committee, which was a whole year-long process. In, and an open space committee, which is another year-long process. All of those committees came out with recommendations that went into the boom, comprehensive plan. So it was very slow, very deliberate, and the numbers were based on data that was taken from census data as well as real numbers. The question I had, you don't have to answer right now, but the question I had is the 1.2 people for bedroom or 1.8 people, um, Dan had mentioned that there's a positive ROI for the town. What I remember with the growth in services is that the only positive for the town in terms of growth was manufacturing. Offices cost more in services than they did in tax revenue. Residential houses cost more by about $1,800 or $1,500 per, per student per year or per bedroom per year or something like that. Every single one, the growth in services. I went. I tried to get on the. Um, I tried to get on the website, but it's not on the website anymore. And I'm sure those numbers are kind of old. But we based our numbers about the 135. Were based on all those kinds of facts. And in addition, I would actually I, I disagree with Dan in terms of the character of the community, because I think there was discussion about whether we wanted 300 unit apartment complexes. Now, I'm not saying I don't agree that those that you're talking about right now are in great places if you're going to have that, but I do think that's something you need to talk to the community about. And when our attitude survey showed that they didn't want that big, that was part of the growth management discussion on 135. So anyway, I'm not sure where you got the numbers, but like the Rotulos, I remember getting specifically from planning decisions, Rotulos numbers of number of kids in that um, one across from the library. Number of bedrooms years. matters. Num yeah, mm -hmm. number of bad bedrooms matter. Definitely. And Dan does have the growth and services report. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll publish all of this, but in fact, uh, the sort of units that we're talking about tonight uh, are a net positive. But what I, I guess what I'm concerned about is that demographic, demographics have changed. The other thing that the census has shown is that single parent households, single parent households, has increased. And as affordability has decreased, people, I, I know just anecdotally that I know single moms that are in this town right now with their children in apartments because they want their kids in these schools. So I think that demographics definitely matter. And I guess I would encourage that you, you know, definitely work it. Yeah, work it. 
and do an attitude survey again, I think. Sue, can I ask you a question? So oh, first yeah. I want to mention, because I want to say, you also serve on the Housing Alliance, uh, which is a key aspect of <laughs> your former town council. So I appreciate <coughs> Do you remember back when this started, back when the, <coughs> the growth and services and the, you know, all those uh, committees? The clause that's in the current ordinance says that it's to, if it's to replenish the number of permits to go back to the council, was there a discussion about why it should go back to the council or whether it should go through another entire process? What was the intent of the original committee by putting that clause in there? I think that you, I think they had said it changed in 2008, and I wasn't on the council okay. at that time. So I, I thought at 2001, I didn't even think I was we had a reserve pool, but I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, it right. started out as rolling from one year to the next. Yeah. Oh, I thought it changed earlier. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you're talking about right now, we've ha we haven't even reached the 135 cap, and now you're talking about next year, 2017, right. you could actually go f up to almost 500 <laughs> units with just, yeah, with, with, yeah. with well, because, yeah, because the 200, because, <laughs> yeah, because they could be worth one half. Right? So you're talking 565 units or whatever. And that's without making any changes. Right. So, but if you make changes, then there's no more. So anyway, glad I'm not on here for you. <laughs> you. Uh, just to follow up on the growth and services report, if you actually looked at it today, we can provide to the council, there's a breakdown of luxury apartments versus multi-family units that have more bedrooms. It yeah. gets back to, frankly, gets back to bedrooms and types <coughs> of units. You know, it's sort of nuanced as that sounds. And luxury apartments have um, $600, you know, net positive impact in 1999. Um, $600, that was, um, a single down. family had 1,200 negative. So I think that's probably double that. I mean, single family, we didn't talk about sort of how these sites are maintained, but multifamily is like a commercial site. It's, there's snow removal, ownership of everything is private versus streets being plowed and, and other so we can so statistics. If you can, but, 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 but the problem is that's like 1999 data, so I mean. I suspect the trends are very so you, so, well, so, yeah, so, so we can hold our comments until another time because this is really for the public and uh, I saw that you'd like to speak. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Gail Brazil. I serve on the Central Board. And I guess I would like to bring to, to attention, I think you're missing great opportunities. The great opportunities in these multifamily with these millennials that are out there, these young urban professionals that are looking for places to live. When I go to look, look and bring new faculty members into my college here, they're looking for apartments initially to live in. They can't find anything in Scarborough. They end up in Falmouth and Yarmouth, or they end up in Saco. Folks that want to work in Portland can't find things. They'd like to be in Scarborough, but the closest they can find is Portland. These are folks that are going to be making good money, and when we try to recruit people or we try to recruit students, they cannot find housing in the area. And I think we're missing a great opportunity if we don't think about these multifamily units, which will be able to attract uh, these young urban professionals, these new professionals, as well as potentially students. The second thing I would argue, when you think about this gateway, the people that move into these apartments aren't going to necessarily be concerned around. They want to move into that type of environment. That's what they're, they're comfortable in. You're going to attract people that don't necessarily want the, the other areas that we have in Scarborough. And I don't think if we, if we eliminate those possibilities, we're eliminating people that are going to help be part of our workforce. When I talk to the employers that I know, they can't find people to work in their place because they can't find housing that is nearby that they can afford. And particularly, they want rental apartments when they're starting out as young urban professionals. So, thank you very much. Anyone else? Good evening, uh, Rocky Risborough. Um, thought of a lot of things to say, but I'll, I'll try <laughs> to keep it brief. Um, the 135 cap, as I recall, was was uh, a bunch of developers fighting as hard as they could to get it up to 135. Uh, so that they didn't get put out of business. Um, we felt it should have been 180 at the time, and 135 is basically where we settled. We pushed really hard back then, too, to make sure that the, there was a rollover, because we knew the market was going to turn. We knew that there'd be a downturn, 
and then we knew it would rebound at some point in time and that we'd need those permits. And I maintain that the growth, the, the, this, this whole ordinance is unnecessary. We've never hit the cap. Since the day it was in, you know, put in place, we've never hit the cap. It's been a total waste of time for town staff. It's, 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 you know, Brian, it sucks up a bunch of his time. For what? Let the market do what the market wants to do. That's exactly what happened. You know, we were all worried about growth. It slowed down. It sped up. It's going to continue to do that. Interest rates are a huge driving factor in apartments being built. Why did we go 25, 30 years with no apartments? It wasn't because it wasn't demand. It was demand. But you, couldn't, you couldn't afford to build them. You couldn't make the numbers work. Well, guess what? The forward swap just went to 474 today. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. A month ago, we financed a project at 3 3. Mm -hmm. Those numbers work. Getting up into the fives, it's going to get a little scary. Uh, I personally would not be proposing a 300 unit project today. I don't. I wouldn't have the nerve to do it. But uh, <coughs> that being said, you've got an opportunity. And uh, I do feel that, that they. That they produce income for the town. Um, they also provide an opportunity for people who live in the town that maybe can't afford or don't want to own a house. Uh, we, uh, as a lot of people know, have built uh, a handful of units uh, in the last 15 months. We've built a hundred and, I'm trying to think of where we're at right now, we're not quite done our third project. We're about, a, we're about 120 units deep in Westbrook. Um, all one and two bedroom units. That's something I want to focus on. The number of bedrooms makes the difference. One and two bedroom apartments don't produce a lot of children. Now, I personally think there's nothing wrong with kids. I think that's really why we're put on earth, is to raise kids. But it costs money to educate them, and I, and I understand the, the concern. So one and two bedroom units, our units, you know, the proof is in the pudding. If you look at Foxcroft, that's 104 units. They're all two bedroom. And I can't remember what you said, Karen, nine kids. Uh, 120 units deep in Westbrook. We have two school-aged children in our units so far. We had uh, Mark Ironman has done a couple of studies, and updated things for us. Um, he told us uh, in the first 146, we should be looking at around three. And we've got another 110 units proposed uh, in Westbrook right now, and we're planning on another three there. So, uh, and, and, it's, and it's proving out. I mean, you look at Foxcroft, he did bring up Coach Lanton. Coach Lanton had a few more. Coach Lanton has, I believe, almost half of three bedroom units. There's a big difference, uh, very big difference. So, um, what we've been doing is market rate, and, and that's, uh, that's kind of an, an important piece. Um, we know that. Our units in particular, our one bedroom units are renting in the 1250 range, which includes heat hot water. We know that's right about where market is for those. Those are 750, a little under 750 square feet in size. <coughs> our two bedroom units are um, about 1,000 square feet in size. Those rent for 1,400, again, heat and hot water included. That's actually probably about 100 bucks under market right now, but we've chosen to keep them there to keep them full. We're, we're full right now. We're bringing a 12-unit building online every month. And every first of the month, 12 people. So we've had no problem filling them. Uh, our next building actually isn't available until February 1st. It's spoken for, and we're, we're filling, uh, filling the, the March building right now. So the market demand is there, and that's why you're seeing you know, the, the demand for it. Um, I would encourage you to... Uh, not miss the opportunity. If someone wants to build these kind of units uh, in the Haggis Parkway area, I think it is a good opportunity for the town. I don't see how it hurts the town financially, um, but it also gives, it, it, it helps us be a town. We need multi-family housing, we need single-family housing, we need all types of housing. Um, and perhaps there is a way to, to help meet some of the affordable needs. I personally have a project coming uh, that we're going to try to work some of that in. And that's on Muzzy Road. You folks don't know anyone. You just work with the zone change. So um, that's moving forward. Other towns are receiving this kind of growth as well. I have a 118 unit project going in South Portland right now. We are the GC on a 96 unit project in Cumberland right now. Uh, 
So there's, there's a lot going on in, in other towns too, but uh, the needs there, um, you know, what's being done in, in the city of Portland right now, I don't think is meeting the, the market rate um, workforce housing type need. I don't think there's any, hardly any of that going on in the city of Portland. It's going around, going on in the surrounding towns. And, uh, you know, eventually we're going to hit that. You know, the market study said 2,000 units. We're going to hit that at some point. Um, I'm not sure what happens, but I look at that and go, well, who, who does that hurt if there's a little bit of a glut? The price of the rent goes down. That's, you know, it's not, it's not going to hurt the town. Um, so, um, to sum it up, I, I think you should uh, you should certainly roll these roll these things forward. I, I don't I don't remember when that changed in the ordinance. Um, we need you know we need to keep permits available. As a developer, we need to know that okay, we get this project approved. You know, we'll be with our project on Muzzy Road. We'll be we'll be around 150 grand deep before we ever even think about putting a shovel in the ground. I really like not to spend that kind of money without thinking I could get a building permit. It, it's definitely a concern. Um, I do want to urge you also on the zoning. And I know that the comp plan is, is coming up and can be looked at again. Great work was done on the comp plan. We've got good zoning in this town. I'm hoping that nobody thinks we need any major changes to that. It's, it's, it's really close and in the ballpark of where we should be. Every now and then, Dan sees a, little, you know, a tweak that has to happen. And, and the council has worked with him on that, and, and I think that all makes sense. But I urge you not to make any big changes to that, to the to zoning in this town. So, with that, Rocky, Rocky, thank you. Uh, you've got projects in Carmelin and Westbrook, and we've got a good school system. And, and I think one of the questions that I've heard, or concerns I've heard people say, is people would want to come here with school aged children because it is a good school system. Well, the same would be said of Cumberland, certainly, and in South Portland, they're very good. Uh, have you got any sense of, you know, pushback that Westbrook is a low number because people have uh, questions about the school system and therefore there's, there's just not as many uh, children with parents coming? Or can you kind of address, I know you mentioned Cumberland and... Um. Well, Cumberland is under construction right now. We don't have anything leased at this point in time, uh, as well as South Portland, which just started. Um, and so I don't, I don't really have a lot of good information for you there. But um, you know, would would someone come here for the school system? Yeah, I guess maybe you could you could get some. But the fact of the matter is, the units aren't conducive to, to large families. They're not. They just they just don't work. Um, and as as market rate. Um, Housing, we, we still do have a few rights as, as landowners, as uh, unit owners, and we can stipulate, uh, you know, federal, federal law lets us say, you know, only two, two occupants per bedroom. Uh, so, you know, in a one-bedroom unit, you just really aren't going to get many kids. In two-bedroom units, yeah, you may, you may get some children, and maybe because it's Scarborough, you might be able to get a little bump in that. It would be interesting to talk to Mark Ivan and see what he thinks about that. Uh, you know, maybe there's a bump, but still, the projects are not laid out well. They're not, they're not family housing, and so I really don't think you're going to see a lot. So, the school system comes up, doesn't come up much in the discussion of it, it really people who have an interest up, in renting. You know, in, in our Westbrook project, it, it hasn't come up. I mean, we have we have two school age children there, and, and the truth of the matter is, only one goes to school in Westbrook, uh, and that's that's 120 units in. Uh, we have we have we have professional people. We have you know. A lot of, we've got some firefighters there, we've got a bunch of grad students. I think we've got, you know, 10 or 12 units rented to, to grad students. We, our, um, the ages are, we've got one group, 20 to 29 is about 58% of all of our units. And then from there it kind of, it, it's scattered, there's no, there's no, and I provided some numbers to Dan, I can I get you an update on that, Dan, that was about a month and a half ago, I think I gave that to you, but, uh, you know, so we've got some real-time data that we, that we certainly can, can share. But we've got a really nice, you know, mix of, of a lot of workforce people and we've got firefighters and police officers and nurses and people that work for the banks and insurance companies. And, um, you know, these are market rate apartments. We're very choosy on who gets to rent uh, in our units. I mean, we, we run them, you know, if you don't have a 600 credit score, you don't get in. You don't pass a background check, you don't get in. 
Um, so, you know, they're, they're good, good quality uh, tenants and you know, people that, that we need living, living here in town. So. Thank you. So, Rocky, I wonder if you could address maybe uh, where you're at in the market cycle, just generally. I mean, you're obviously one of a, popular, a bunch of general contractors who are building units and stuff. Are you, would you classify this kind of middle of the of the upswing, mid, you know, beginning of the upswing? We're kind of peaking now, peaking a little bit later on. Just ballpark. I think we're heading down. We're heading down. We're heading down. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're heading down. I think, you know, we do a lot of residential houses, and we've got a handful going, but... I think we've got a little we've got a little lull going on right now, and as you know, as I said, the demand for apartments uh, it's going to it'll be it'll be interest rate driven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Going twice, three times. Well, um, so um, it's a little after 8 o'clock, it's like 8 10. I want to thank everyone for coming, uh, our guests and speakers, as well as uh, our friends on the different boards that have participated. Again, if you could submit to uh, the town manager any questions that you have that will help you, as well as anyone else, um, in the discussion for December 21st. That's also an invitation to the public. Um, if you could send those to the town manager. If you'd like to CC or uh, send it also to the town council, there is that group email, and we'd be happy to make sure the manager has those and answers it. And uh, with that, we'll uh, adjourn. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. That was Thank a lot. You. Thanks, Dan. All right. See you in the morning. Thank you.